Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Ted Ladd. Ted, I am so excited for this conversation. Your energy is already infectious, and I'm, I'm just really excited to dive in. I am too, but the audience doesn't even know who I am yet. So they're thinking that your infection is your own psychosis. <laughs> now, just by me saying that, they now understand what you're talking about. Yep, they, they get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's dive right in, shall we? Mm -hmm. What in your mind is innovation? My answer to this is going to be remarkably uncompelling. So innovation is anything that creates value for anybody. And the reason that that's so important is because anybody can do it. We used to think, and still too many people out there think that innovation is only in the domain of the research and development department, mm. or there's some spectacular entrepreneur who was born to do this. And they are the only people who can come up with new ideas. And I reject that. Mm. Innovation is anything that creates something valuable for anybody else. I innovate all the time for my wife. It has nothing to do with commercialization or profitability. My goal with my marriage is to make her happy. I got to innovate to do it. <laughs> so anybody can do it. That's why I can deliver such an unsexy definition intentionally to make it accessible to everybody. Mm. Now, that is so important, and I really appreciate the breadth of that definition for the reason you outlined. And it's particularly important coming from someone with your background and experience, because you have on paper every right to create a nuanced, complex definition of what innovation is and who is allowed to innovate and who isn't. And so I think it's particularly important coming from you for people to hear this notion that there are no privileged few that can innovate or should innovate. It's the domain of everyone. So for your listeners, let me give you the quick background so that they can understand that statement. Sure. I teach innovation at Harvard University, Stanford University, and the Holt International Business School. And the latter, Holt International Business School, that's really my home campus. And I've been a former dean of campus and former dean of research there. Holt has campuses in San Francisco, Boston, New York, London, Shanghai, and Dubai. And 95% of our students are non-American. So they come into my classroom in San Francisco or any of the other campuses. I teach all over the world. And they look to me to say, okay, what is innovation? You must know. And I deliver this remarkably simple answer. And then the, the first reaction, Jared, is disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I paying all this money exactly. to go here, lad, say, this is really easy. I could have done this at home. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the next step. I have done lots of research on the types of people who are innovative, the processes that lead to innovation, and then the patterns of innovation. Mm. I have a book that's just coming out coincidentally today called Innovating with Impact, published by The Economist. And the thesis of the book is everybody can do this. And we walk through who typically is innovative, but don't let that stop you. Even if you're not, don't fit the profile. What kind of organizations are innovative? And if you're not in one, don't let that stop you. Then we get into recipes. How do you construct a hypothesis and then go out and test it? And the beautiful part of a recipe like that, this is also called design thinking or the lean startup method. And this is where... I got my PhD literally on saying, does the lean startup method work? Oh, wow. And for whom? The lean startup method had just been sort of bottled and released to the public. And I said, does this work or not? Like, how do I know? Hmm. So the book diagrams and walks people through, here is how you can start with a good idea, brainstorm a little bit, maneuver a little bit, and then go talk to people to hone and refine the idea. This is why it is so vital for me in my classrooms 
to ensure that people don't feel like they're in a pigeonhole. And here's where it typically goes. People who are in sales think that they're automatically innovative mm. and that they automatically create value. Let's be clear. I was in sales in Silicon Valley for 25 years. So that arrogance is absolutely, I am viewed with it. And then the engineers in the room are saying, couldn't possibly me. Where's my code? I don't want to go talk to people. And the recipes that we put in this book walk you through, what are you asking people? How do you construct some initial ideas, tease out the assumptions? What must be true mm. for that idea to actually generate value for anybody else? And then we have them launch. And in my classroom, the salespeople, sort of the extroverts, realize that just because they say it doesn't mean it's valuable. Mm. <laughs> and the engineers realize, wait a minute, I've been thinking about 20 different things that could be valuable. I now can have the courage to get out and talk to people. So mm. what I'm really doing in my classroom, and I'm teasing mostly about the sales folks, right. they also recognize that after a few sessions, that they also have ideas that could be valuable, but they're trying to push them on people instead of stopping, figuring out what the customer problem is, mm. finding them, and then delivering more value. So everybody can make a step in my classes. The key for me as a professor and as a, frankly, as a human being is affirmation. Affirmation. The reason people don't innovate is because they don't think that they can. That's a confidence problem. Mm. And I can solve that. Interesting. I can solve that in the classroom. I can solve it in the book. Hopefully what I've been doing with you when you were you and I have just been joking around yeah. is to express appreciation for what you're doing to try and spread innovation and then make you laugh. I'm hoping that your confidence about what you're able to do and what you're able to get out of me goes up mm. just by talking to me. Literally, I'm hoping you are feeling more innovative now because I'm throwing energy at you and I'm throwing respect and affirmation at you. So you hopefully are feeling more powerful. And that kind of power, that leads you to take the ideas that are lingering in the back of your head and say, well, what happened? Hmm. If I use the whiteboard, which I can see behind you over your right shoulder, if I use that whiteboard and started a little teeny sandbox of ideas, what are the assumptions underneath those ideas and how do I figure out whether they're true or not? Hmm. That's my goal with the book, with my classes, and Jared, right now with you. Sorry for being so manipulative, Jared, but that's what I do all day. <laughs> and if you can't tell i love doing it oh yeah oh yeah i feel the power ted i feel it so thank you i love this concept of affirmation as it relates to innovation looking back at the sort of framework you laid out around types of people processes and patterns when you think about affirmation does that have a type is there a type that needs more or less affirmation as it relates to innovation do you see any themes in that regard I do. I have from my research, and this gets kind of interesting. So I live in Wyoming, mm. and I grew up on dude ranches, and I was a member of the Wyoming Game and Fish Grizzly Bear Team, tracking and trapping grizzly bears. So before all of this academic stuff and the Silicon Valley tech stuff, I am, to my core, I'm a ranch hand. Mm. You don't call yourself a cowboy. That's not a title you can give yourself. Other people can give that to you. But if you want to be humble, you say, I'm a ranch hand. Got it. Got it. But I could say you're a cowboy. You can. Yeah. Especially since I actually have a saddle right over there. Oh, yeah. When I'm on long conference calls, it's on rollers. I literally roll it around and sit in the saddle and be set on long conference calls. That's a cowboy. So John Wayne, therefore, when I was growing up, was sort of this powerful symbol. And I wrote a paper called Waynesian Self-Efficacy. I literally <laughs> took his name and said, here's what it is. And Waynesian Self-Efficacy, as I defined it, isn't confidence that you will create value. That's not what it is. Wayne's efficacy is confidence that if you go out and talk to people, and if you start, you can eventually arrive at something that will help people. Mm. In other words, Wayne's in self-efficacy isn't the John Wayne swagger. Wayne's in self-efficacy is John Wayne in a movie called The Searchers. Mm. where he is looking for people and he's disappointed. Oh, gosh. But he is absolutely sure the entire movie, he will find them. Yes. Ooh, that's a hard movie to watch. It's an amazing movie. It but is it a hard is. movie to watch. This is why the people who are already convinced that if they continue, they will find value, those people need less affirmation. 
the people who start either saying, I can't do it, or this is really easy, I've already done it. Those are the people that I have to work with more to say, okay, let me figure out how to build up your affirmation so it's not insecurity right. that leads to arrogance and therefore trying to push stuff on people that they don't want, um, or insecurity that leads people to say, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Right, right, right. I can imagine it's a tightrope to walk because you could go overboard into the world of hubris where I'm certain that the outcome will come. So I'm not as concerned about the processes and the patterns that I need to internalize and create to ensure that it would come. Yeah. Oh, and, and as a professor, I got 800 pounds of hubris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you know if somebody went to or works at Harvard? Oh, they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first step. Mm -hmm. The second step are these recipes. Okay. The second step is, is there a formula? And the answer is, there's a formula for figuring out what people need and then refining it. There is no formula for you to sit in a room by yourself and create an innovation. Mm. That formula doesn't exist. And by the way, if it existed, everybody would be doing it and therefore we'd be flooded with innovations. And one of the aspects of innovation is that it's novel, right? that you have a new way to create value for somebody. And so therefore, if the formula were like, add water here, innovation pops out, everybody would do that. If anybody writes a book like that, I will buy it and everybody else will read it, but it won't work for very long. Right. Only the first few people who do the formula will have it work, and then everybody else will be creating the same things that those forerunners. The novelty will disappear. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the formulas are more about have a process for it. Mm. And then we get into the trajectories. There have been several different patterns of innovation, especially in the last, let's call it 20 years, but they didn't get popular until 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we have seen patterns emerge for ways that you can organize resources to be more innovative. Mm. And I'll give you one example. This happens to be my favorite thing in the whole world. Multi-sided platform business model. If you see a problem in the world where you know that there is two people who haven't met and can't meet because it's too painful, costly, coordination is tough, right. transaction is tough, there's an opportunity there for a platform. Right now, if you look at the top 10 most valuable companies in the world, seven of our multi-sided platforms. And those seven are also the newest additions mm -hmm. to the top 10. Mm -hmm. I saw something from the World Economic Forum recently that said that 30% of the world's economic activity goes through platforms. Okay, we're platform natives. Think about that 10 years ago. We didn't have platforms, really. Right. And part of that was because we didn't have ubiquitous mobile internet in our hands. Right. That was one of the enablers. But multi-sided platforms create a different way to innovate and a different way to create value. Mm. And here's the quick story for you, Jared. I said I'd bring a prop. Yes. When I was in Silicon Valley, all I know are multi-sided platforms. When I teach entrepreneurship to students, they say, why are we focusing so much on platforms? And I say, because I am a one-note trumpet. <laughs> or actually, because I'll go back to the ranch and I'm a one-trick pony. There you go. <laughs> all I know is multi-sided platforms. And so that has been my career. I worked in the early days at Palm. They made the mm -hmm. Palm Pilot. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I had the unbelievable job of being the company spokesman. I was, was called the platform evangelist during our IPO. Oh, wow. And I was just trying to predict how mobile technology would change the world. And frankly, I undershot. Wow. And this has changed everything. And then more recently, we did a startup in Silicon Valley where we built a smartwatch. And we built the software, we built the hardware, and my job was the multi-sided platform piece of this. How do you get developers to build apps and so we can have an app store? Mm. So we can provide value to the customer who's wearing the watch, but we didn't make the apps. We have other people who are earning value and they're innovating with their apps. So yeah, it's all I know, one trick pony. Very nice. And it didn't work. Mm. Our business model wasn't quite right. We had not followed the processes that I now know to be effective. And as a result, we didn't have the business model right. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up selling this to Google. And if you are wearing a Garmin or a Sunto or a Samsung or a Michael Kors or a Tag Cure or a Casio smartwatch, all of those run Wear OS, which is what we made. And all of the apps that you're running, that was my job was to figure out how to get those people going. 
and vision not just a mobile world on a smartphone as I had done at Palm, right. but an ultra mobile world on your wrist. Wow. I literally have a, a Google Watch. So that is yeah. remarkably relevant. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty, it, it was very fun to build. And our problem wasn't the technology, the idea it was the business model. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was how we chose to approach it. I can imagine. Yeah. Just circling a minute back to the Palm, I had a pre and people have no appreciation for the game changing nature of the Palm Pre. I mean, that introduced cards, right? It introduced the fact that you could run multiple apps at the same time and switch between them and all those things. We also were the ones who created the mobile internet. And back then, there wasn't enough bandwidth to do a full fledged mobile site. Right. So part of my job, I went up to Seattle and convinced Amazon to do their first mobile app. Right. And I went over to eBay in Silicon Valley and convinced Meg Whitman that eBay should do its first mobile app. And Mrs. Whitman said, who was CEO at the time, said, give me the pitch for this. Like, why should I care? And my reply to her was, where do you think people are buying and selling goods when they're sitting in front of their desktop computer or every other time in the day? Mm. <laughs> and she said, okay, done. Let's do it. Wow. One of the things that Palm did was say, let's simplify this. Yeah. Let's make the technology simple. Let's make it easy for developers. They simplified it. Such an important step in the evolution of where we are today with smartphones, with purchase technology, all those things. So there's really no way to overstate the role you played in that. I was one of many. Yes. At Palm, yes. I, when I joined, there were 500. When I left, there were 5,000. One of many. Right, right. You being Palm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm arrogant, but not that. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. Now, as you were sharing that story and it was unfolding in my head, I'm thinking about all the different elements of what it takes to bring something to market and bring it to life. And you talked about the types and the processes and the patterns, but I'm sure Palm and other companies you've worked at had an accounting department. And what frustrates me is I've been doing innovation work for 20 years in Fortune 500 companies and nonprofits and all sorts of places. What frustrates me is that you alluded to it earlier about the, it's the R&D team's job to do, to innovate. And innovation is something that's externally focused, is the other implied thing. I love the title of your book, Innovating with Impact. As you think about impact, do you see great examples of people thinking about the impact of innovation on an internal basis? Does that question make sense? Absolutely. It does. And let me actually, you referenced the accounting department. Accounting departments need innovation just like anybody else. Right. All of the ratios that they're taught at school, and I know this because while I don't understand accounting, I did have to learn it at one point, <laughs> get my MBA. Right. Literally. Don't understand any of it. <laughs> I walk into an accounting class and look at them and I will just start clapping. And they're saying, what's this professor doing in the background? I'll say, you speak a language I can only aspire to remember. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm so incredibly proud of you. And I have to be careful with the condescension there, but you know, professor, I can get up time set. <laughs> accountants need innovation. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Okay. If you're an accountant and therefore you have internal customers, presumably in both cost centers, so you have to make sure that your that your budgets and it's leaders who are trying to make to prioritize different possible strategies. Right. They're your customers. What problems do they have that your accounting department isn't yet solving? You can't just sit in a box in your room and say, okay, I'm going to change the ratio and deliver it to them. No, 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 no. Go ask them. Right. Go ask the managers who's using your accounting dashboard and say, okay, what don't you know from this? Right. We don't have the data. I'll tell you. We don't have the data, but maybe we can go get the data. Or is there a different way for me to do this calculation? And don't just throw it out there say, what's your problem? And then can I solve it with a novel way to construct data and to deliver data and to have different feedback on the data and to have drill downs on the data? So accounting departments, if you're an accountant right now listening to this, you need to innovate. Everybody in the company needs to innovate. And it's not just for the sake of profitability. It's also for the sake of human evolution and happiness, right? If you get to innovate, you feel more a part of the company, of the culture, 
of the mission that the company is attempting to deliver, you will have impact. So that's the first answer for this. But let me go to a second answer for this. After teaching for, I don't know, 15 years now, I've seen tons of students who come to me with what they think are innovative ideas. And they say, hey, listen, so what I really want to know is where should I hire the engineer to build it? <laughs> and I'll say, no, stop. Don't build anything. Yeah. Almost all innovations, and there are a few exceptions to this, for almost all innovations, the problem is not technological. The problem is determining what customer demand is. Mm. What do they need? The most valuable person in any company is not the engineer. It's not the chief information officer. It's whoever in the company understands demand. Mm. So I keep having students go back and say, whoa. And the second you build something, even something as simple as a website or an app, so once you've done that, you've codified your biases. You now have written them down and it's even harder for me to change your mind now that you're heading in the wrong direction. I'm just one data point for them, right? I, I don't know if they're heading in the right direction or wrong direction. Right. I only know that they're following a process or they're not following a process. Right. So technology is not the problem. Let me give you a third answer to this question. If you believe that innovation can be process driven, that there are ways, there are formulas, there are recipes for everybody in the company to innovate, this should change what the job of managers is. Mm -hmm. This means that they're not the ones who are either coming up with new ideas or picking and choosing which ideas are the best. Mm -hmm. Instead, they are more like coaches for the process. And if anybody in the company can come up with an interesting innovation, prove that customers want it, prove the pricing for it, the messaging, these are all part of the innovation, prove the marketing, the channel possibilities, then it the managers have been coaching them along the way, then the manager doesn't have a decision to make about whether you pursue it or not. You're saying you reach the bar. And if we have 10 things that reach the bar, let's do it. Yeah, right. And then you get an innovative financing and how do you say, okay, we're short on cash. Next part of your innovation, I need you to figure out how to do this with less cash. Okay, let's revise the innovation for that particular optimization. Right. That means that managers can empower the people that work for them instead of being the decision makers to decide which ideas go forward and which don't. Mm. That's a huge shift yeah. to most company culture. It is a huge shift. And it is a, I think, a delineator between those who have been seen as innovative for generations and those who come and go because it's that institutional point of view on innovation that really embeds that sort of thinking into an organization. If you look back at the early days of Disney, Walt was seen as the innovator and Roy was the money guy. But the things Roy Disney did to finance Disneyland are as innovative as anything that was designed or done at Disneyland. Yeah. I think that your description, those three points really are so crucial because even in organizations where leaders talk about innovation a lot, it can sometimes land as being a consumer, end user, externally focused thing and miss the internal customers and the opportunity to delight yeah. those internal customers. Or when leaders talk, say, we need to be an innovation focused company. What they're really saying is, give me all of your ideas and I'll pick which one <laughs> I want to do. Right. That's neither empowering nor particularly effective for innovation because the CEO doesn't have any more handle on the assumptions that underlie a potential innovation. What must be true for this to be successful than anybody else? That's right. So it's, the CEO should be the loudest coach for process-driven innovation, no doubt. which leads me to do a quick side mention. So yes, I wrote a book. If you buy it, great. But what you absolutely should read if you're listening to this, is anything by Rita McGrath. Hmm. Professor McGrath is based at the Columbia Business School, and her writing is crisp, articulate, and always insightful. So in other words, don't buy my book. Go buy hers. <laughs> or she has this newsletter called Thought Sparks. Every time it comes out, I pause whatever I'm doing and read it. 
Wow. And she has been writing recently on the permissionless organization. Mm. How do you have processes and rules that guide people, but where they don't need your permission to pursue something as long as they're following the guardrails, the boundaries that you set, and following the processes that you expect for them to innovate, there's no approval needed. Because they're baked into how the organization operates. The process will refine the profitability of this idea right. by itself. Mm. Read a McGrath. So that's beautiful. Yeah. We'll have to see if we can get her on the show. In my opinion, she is the best management thinker and strategic thinker in the world right now. So if you get her on the show, oh my God, I will, <laughs> I will, well, I will watch. I, I'll come to Atlanta and sit in the background so I just can, can sit in on it. What all she can say is no, right? All she can say is no. And what is also particularly <laughs> remarkable about Professor McGrath, Dr. McGrath, I've met her a few times, but I don't want to presume familiarity here, Sure, is that she is a woman in a field that has been dominated by white men. Mm-hmm. Right, Michael Porter, most famous strategist ever, created the concept of sustainable competitive advantage. She wrote a book, said, no, that doesn't work anymore. It's transient advantage. And for the audience members, that's what they should listen to. She took on the establishment of strategy, and she has won. Her ideas are better. Mm, that is progress. Yeah. We are light years away from a true meritocracy where the best idea wins. But it's so important to celebrate and champion those moments when it does actually happen. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. I will circle and underline her name and educate myself accordingly. Thanks for sharing that. I love the conversation around what innovation is. I just would love to hear your answer to what isn't innovation. The late Clayton Christensen. Mm-hmm. What a beautiful soul. I've been thinking about his writings and things a lot and yep. I've been talking. Yep. Yeah. What a beautiful soul. Yep. If any of you haven't had a chance to just listen to him, he passed away a few years ago, Harvard Business School professor who coined the term disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. Super calm guy. And he even wrote a book. You'll have to look up and put it in the notes. Yeah. Something like how to know what matters. As he knew he was dying from a disease, his students asked him to provide the commencement address. And he said, great, let me take all of the theories that we've been using in strategy and apply them to how you could improve your own life. Mm. What a thoughtful, incredibly calm man. When you first start watching the video, you're going to be bored. And you're like, oh my God, he's sort of monotone, doesn't get excited at all. That to me, if you start listening, is part of the spectacular nature that he had. He's just so calm and nice to everybody. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to me, not excitable, which means he's probably more logical. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but he distinguished between sustaining innovation and radical innovation. And sustaining innovation are small improvements, typically to lower costs or to make small changes to revenue. So that's still innovative. Mm-hmm. So if you're listening to this, if that's what you want to do, if that's what you have on your mind, start there. No problem. Radical innovations are ones that try to get non-consumers to consume. Hmm. or to put this outside of capitalism, to get people who didn't think that they had a problem to acknowledge that they have a problem and then solve the problem for them. Let me give you one small example. I don't know if this is self-serving or not, and I don't know if she hears this, whether she can like it or not, Hmm. but I have an innovation for my marriage. Whenever I leave on a trip, (laughs) you're laughing. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) So this is important to me. Yeah. Not just for you, but for all of the audience out there, I am not all about profitability or tech. To me, innovation, my marriage is the most significant thing in my life after perhaps my health. But even then, when I have a cold, I'm relying on my marriage for my wife to treat me well and hopefully get me better. Solid point. So when I leave for a trip, she is a little unhappy with me. Hmm. I got to go teach. I got to go to this conference. I got to go do something else. I'm just a little bit unhappy with it. So what I do, my innovation here is to take sticky notes write little love notes on the sticky notes and then hide them all around the house. And I do not tell them where they are. I let her discover them. And every now and then, 10 years later, she'll come across a sticky note that I wrote. (laughs) That is a slightly radical innovation, right? It's something that I had never heard before. I had never seen other couples do before. Right. I'm not trying to work just on the margins, right? I'm not trying to lower costs or make her slightly happier. Right. I'm trying to dramatically alter her mood and her opinion of me when I'm not in the room. Mm. 
that's a great example, a great example. And I'm sure that's yeah. going to be reapplied by some listeners immediately. She does not do it for me and I don't mind. Yeah. No problem. That's not the problem I have. Right. The problem she has is disconnection. Right. When we're not together, I can solve some of that. Right. Right. Yeah. It's back to Christensen's job to be done philosophy exactly. at its core. Yeah. What is the job to be done? And a quick tip. One great place to put the sticky note on the toothpaste bottle. Interesting. Because she uses it every morning and every night. So the, yeah. the first time that she goes, I have a tiny little thing saying your smile is beautiful or something like that. And sometimes they're that cheesy and sometimes they're not that cheesy. They're funny. Mm. But she'll grab it and she'll be like, oh, okay, now here I am brushing my teeth. What I thought was a mundane thing that had nothing to do with my marriage. And now he's making me laugh and he's not even here. That is a pro tip. Pro tip. Only here, Jared, only with you. Pro tip only <laughs> with you. I won't share that pro tip with anybody else. All right. We are... Uh, exclusive. We got that exclusive. That's right. I love it. I love it. Before we wrap up, I want to circle back to your talk about MSPs. Multi-sided platforms. Multi-sided platforms. Yes. Sorry. And I, I actually had coffee today with a fellow... I also helped lead a, a nonprofit. And I had a coffee with a fellow nonprofit leader, and we were talking about the challenges of that basically multi-sided platform model. And it seems like, it feels like it's ripe for innovation. The age-old model of people with money give money, and then an organization takes that money and turns it into value for other people, but they have to invest time, effort, and resources in asking for the money because it's not coming from the people who experience the benefit from the organization. It feels inefficient and almost like there might be an opportunity for another model. Okay. I think I understand the question, but let me back up a little bit. Some authors recently wrote that you can look at a, they called it a donative nonprofit. Mm -hmm. In other words, philanthropists yes. who are yep. giving money and serving other people as a multi-sided platform. And I don't think so. Okay. Because the donor and the recipient almost never meet. Mm. That's not the problem for a nonprofit. The nonprofit itself isn't just a coordination mechanism okay. to get the donor and the service provider to meet. The nonprofit typically is adding a ton of value to figure out, okay, how do I provide a service? So many nonprofits are actually linear business models that are service providers. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's just fine. Sure. The reason that I disagreed sort of virulently and I'm going to present a paper in Reno next week nice. saying a donative nonprofit is not automatically a multi-sided platform is because if we abuse some of the principles of a multi-sided platform, we diluted them. If everything can act or function like a multi-sided okay. platform, then all of a sudden, okay. what's the distinction? What are the key principles? So right. for this, there are nonprofits that are multi-sided platforms. Right. Kiva. Yes. Right. Kiva, which literally is matching. Right. You get to meet, at least sort of informally, the person who is receiving the benefits of your donation. Sure. So you can have a nonprofit that is a multi sided platform, but all nonprofits are not multi sided platforms. Got it. Now, you understand that, Ted. I hope so. Yes. I think the difference is whether it is a multi sided platform versus whether philanthropists see it as a multi-sided platform from a value creation standpoint. Because your definition of multi-sided platform is built around connection. Connection. It's it. And some people build it around different elements of how a multi-sided platform works. I like your definition. Mm -hmm. I think what multi-sided platforms and nonprofits have in common is that there's an intermediate sort of transformation of value. And it's almost the efficiency or inefficiency of that value transformation is what I'm curious about. So dollars become meals on wheels. Yeah. Dollars become life-saving cancer drugs. Yep. And the efficiency of the transformation of that value from one form to another, that's probably not a multi-sided platform. That's not a multi-sided platform, but that absolutely is a topic that is ripe for innovation. Right. And here, there are two audiences right? because they're not going to connect. It's not a multi-sided platform. But this is a multi-sided business model, or it's a business model with multiple constituencies. Yes, yes. And each constituency has a different problem. Right. The people who need a meal on wheels, 
they have a different problem, right? They're hungry and they don't have the money or they can't get out of their house because of some other condition, right? So they have a problem and there are different ways to solve that. And Meals on Wheels is only one way to solve that. Exactly. There are a whole bunch of other ways to get those people some nutrition. Right. On the other side, there are philanthropists and philanthropists have a problem. Some want fame, some want to feel good, some want a tax break, right? They have a different set of problems and the challenge for any entity, nonprofit, for-profit, family, couples, relationships, mm. the challenge is to figure out what do the nonprofits that you're working with, what do they care about? How do you figure that out? This is where you go back to the processes of innovation. Right. What assumptions are you making about who they are and what they care about? And can you either adjust those assumptions or find the people for whom those assumptions are true? Right, right. You don't necessarily have to change what you're doing. Maybe you need to change what kinds of philanthropists you are seeking help from. Or, and this is probably kind of built into that, but, or maybe the problem you're solving is not a 501c3 nonprofit fit. Maybe a philanthropic means of driving value isn't the most efficient and effective way to create that value. And I think a lot of people default to nonprofit when they want to do something good. Yeah. So nonprofit has two different characteristics. One, it's just the tax status. That's right. You don't pay as much tax. So a for-profit or nonprofit can have the exact same business model. That's right. Same impact. Nonprofit just doesn't pay taxes. Right. But there's a second important piece to this. Nonprofits cannot provide equity. Right. Nobody owns the nonprofit. Right. So if one of the things that a philanthropist wants is a long-term commitment with the organization and a sense of ownership in the organization, either for an emotional ownership or because they think this is going to be a huge idea and they're willing to put more money in, but they want to have subsequent benefit or say over the idea, then you can't do a nonprofit. Right. Because philanthropists can't own equity. That sounds to me then like a for-profit. And instead of philanthropists, they're angel investors. And that might solve some of the problems that they have and still address the clientele that you're working on. Well said. So people in underrepresented groups typically feel the impact of social issues and are more likely to found nonprofits. Nonprofits don't generate wealth. And so that is a situation where it kind of becomes a loop where the people who are affected most have the most heart for it. And so they start a nonprofit, but by making yourself the leader of a nonprofit, you are then excluded from, if you work there for 20 years, you're not creating wealth. And so the wealth gap is not addressed by it. So those are the kinds of loops that I find interesting and potentially ripe for innovation. Can I add a piece to that? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Not all startups are successful. And sometimes, actually, most are not. That's exactly right. And sometimes the nonprofit lack of federal tax payment could be the difference between a nonprofit working and a for-profit failure. Yes, it's a risk. And a nonprofit can pay its people whatever it wants. Right. There is no limit. So it is possible for people who found nonprofits to become wealthy. But they can't hand it to their children, like the House of Morgan or something like that. They can hand the money, that the income that they've made to their children. Right. They can't hand the organization to their children. That's right. Because nobody owns it. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's still salary based. Yeah. It's still capped in that way. It's yeah. not the potentially generational wealth that you can generate owning something. Can I give one other plug to a different author? Sure that I recommend that you approach and that you read and that you can get on the show, you could. Saras Sarasvati. Mm. Professor Sarasvati works at Darden, which is the business school at the University of Virginia. And her key theory is called effectuation. And it's sort of a cousin to the lean startup and design thinking and Rita McGrath's discovery-driven planning. But what she's really talking about is how can people relinquish control over the outcome and instead focus on the process? Mm. And as part of that, who is most likely to do that? Mm. So being an effectual innovator is part of her theory. Like, What does it take for you to change your mindset about how you want to innovate? Mm. Love that. Her theory has been 
is written about a lot. She does lots of workshops. She's also a very approachable writer. She's also a woman of color. And there's a debate over whether her effectuation really is a separate theory or whether it's baked into other things. And for my aspect as a practitioner, I don't care. Right. I, I don't. I, it, <laughs> right. The genealogy yeah. of the idea is right. not important to me. No. If you or any of the other members of the audience read about effectuation and it makes you feel more powerful and confident about innovating, yeah. do it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That is so refreshing to hear from a professor. From an academic? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Before I let you go, this has been an amazing conversation. I want to ask if you have any advice for innovators, which is everyone by your definition. Get off the couch. Mm. Metaphorically, get mm -hmm. off the couch. Don't look for innovation just at work. Look for innovation in your home. Is there a different way you can treat your dog to see if your dog will behave differently? Mm. Innovation is all over the place. And it, everybody can do it. And what is necessary for somebody to innovate is that they start. So get off the couch. Love it. I've been working on my identity. And I've decided my identity is not a professor at Halt and an instructor at Harvard and Stanford. That's not my identity. Mm. I do that. That's my role. Right. And it's my title and it's my institutions. But my identity is a discoverer. And once I say my identity is a discoverer, I still am in the classroom. I'm still doing the same things. But it also means that for this book, for example, I'm now thinking about, okay, what's the next book? Mm. What other ideas are out there? I'm not a particularly good marketer or salesperson, what's the next idea? And also that change in identity also changed what innovation looks like for me. Right. I no longer have to say innovation for me is creating a new master's program or creating a new course on business opportunities in web three. I've done that, that's fun, but discoverer also means that I went down to my basement recently, I ordered a $50 beginner's leather kit from Amazon. And I'm just trying to make a little leather knife sheet for one of my hunting knives. Yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> no idea. And 53 years old with 800 different degrees and all this stuff. And yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a beginner. Mm. Get off the couch and just start. Mm. Do I think I'm going to create new value for somebody else? Maybe not. But I don't know. Yes. A discoverer means that I don't have to know. I go out and discover, and some of the outcome is innovation and impact for the people, and sometimes it's not. Mm. That, to me, is part of the shift in my identity, and that shift may be helpful to some of your listeners to say, you're not an accountant. You're not a podcast host. Mm. Are you a discoverer? Are you a revealer? Are you a dignifier? Are you an affirmer? Are you a challenger? These are all different identities that you could adopt. It might not change what your day looks like. Right. It might change, however, what your ambition is. It's not just the outcome. It's not doing 100 or 500 podcasts. It's not reaching 100,000 people. It's saying, if you, what you think your identity is, is a host. In other words, your identity is to get the most out of me mm. or energy and ideas. If that's your identity, you're still doing the podcast every day, but now you've divorced yourself from the outcome. The point isn't a thousand podcasts and a hundred thousand people. The point is each conversation you have is to be the host mm. and to get the most out of me. If you do that, first of all, it's more likely that that huge outcome will follow. Right. And once you reach that outcome or whatever outcome you set, you're still the host. Mm. If you said my identity is a hundred podcasts, what do you do once you hit that? You feel terrible, right? It's, what's your identity? You've lost it. You're unmoored. Yes. Yep. So I'm guessing, Jared, for you, that you as a host, I'm assuming that's your identity, just from how you've been reacting with me. And that is not restricted to you at this podcast. I'm assuming that when you go to your family gatherings or when you're in a restaurant with a bunch of people you don't know, you're still the host. Mm -hmm. You're still asking questions and drawing the strengths of other people out into the conversation. Am I right there? Yes, I think you're right. I have a preference for introversion, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes people are surprised by how much I talk in certain situations, but it's usually questions. I love questions because I love hearing how people think and engaging with new ideas and new concepts. So if you redefine your identity, 
Mm. So it's core. That means that not only does the podcast fit with your identity, but also means what other innovations can you contemplate that solve the problem that you already know how to solve, but other methods or channels or audiences for whom you could be the host, mm. for whom you could draw out their strength. Mm. That's the shift in my own thinking. And by the way, it was after I wrote this book. I said, because the book, I, got, I did the book. I've always wanted to write a book. I did the book. Okay, now I've written a book. <laughs> Is my identity done? Yeah, right. Should I go back to being a ranch hand right now? I'm done. No, I'm a discoverer. Mm, I love it. That's so helpful to me personally. And I'm certain listeners will extract value from that as well. Ted Ladd, innovation is anything that creates value for anybody. Cowboy, discoverer, professor, all around wonderful human being. Thank you so much for your time today. It's much appreciated. Jared, before you sign off though, let me thank you. And this is important. I said before that what I do in the classroom is affirm. Yep. What you're doing right now, first of all, directly for me, is you're getting me more energized and excited about this idea. You're also introducing innovation to lots of other people. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the podcast and for your work here. There's another layer of appreciation. So gratitude is me saying thank you for what you have done for me and for other people. Appreciation is also the recognition of what you had to do in order to provide that value to other people. Mm -hmm. You have had to learn how to interview. You've had to learn how to brand, how to create a podcast, how to ask these questions, how to have your own nonprofit and your own education and your own business experiences so that you can ask the right question. So Jared, I am deeply appreciative of all that you have done in your life to get us to this podcast. And then I'm grateful for you getting this energy and some of the hilarity <laughs> with me in this podcast. Oh, thank you, Ted. Much appreciated. And I hope the listeners get as much out of this as I did. So thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T-L-L-C, or follow us on LinkedIn where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.